right. This episode is brought to you by the Gallywix Pleasure Palace. The Gallywix Pleasure Palace, where the food is so good, you'll be gobbling it up. It's time to get your battle tech scrolling and that trade chat trolling and buckle up for the podcast about storytelling in the world of Warcraft. This is merely a setback. Greetings, fellow lore walkers, and welcome to Merely a Setback, a podcast about storytelling in the world of Warcraft. My name is Sharku, and I'm coming to you from my podcasting perch high in the mountains of North Carolina. I'm also a player on the Battle.net News. I am a raid leader for the Asparagus Initiative, and I'm a member of the CTR community at large, and just a big blizzophile loving wows all over the place <laughs> i'm sounding like president trump now i feel like i'm making this up as i go it's real um <laughs> no politics no politics let's introduce the other uh hosts that we bring with us this evening as always we have oh my god editing i thought i stopped it sorry the intro just played a second time everyone um so here we go um, we'll try it one more time. Let's introduce our other host for the evening. Hailing from the great white north of Ontario, Canada, it's Shoeboots. Shoeboots, welcome. Hi, Sharku. Uh, it's great to be here, but I don't know if I should be talking to you because I have a head of the curve and you do not, which means that I am a better player than you and I should only be joining pugs that uh, require ahead of the curve to join. Right. So. I'm pretty sure you can get into a Nighthold pug now with the current ahead of the curve. I think that's about where where it is. That's true. Yeah, I've missed the last <laughs> two raid nights. Two weeks ago, you guys downed and tore us. This week, we got uh, had some struggles with the attendance boss. Um, but especially, I wasn't there for either of those nights because real life is a thing that happens sometimes. Um, but I'll be yeah. back soon. I'm just giving you a hard time, of course. Uh, but yes, I, I can get into Nighthold normal with my yeah, head of the curve. Right. And uh, I'm trying to get my item level up to 960 so I can possibly get into some Tumas Argaris. Yeah, still still tough to get in those Tumas Argaris LFRs, I know, uh, unless you have the uh, the mythic the mythic achievement at this point. So I get it. I get it, guys. Um, you know, we only want we only want good raiders. And you can tell how good of a raider is based on their achievement score. That's 100 percent true. Also joining us. From the live music capital of the world in Austin, Texas. He made me say that. I disagreed about whether or not that was the music capital of the world. Whatever. He's from Austin, though. It's Jared. Jared, how are you doing? Can you handle all the live music that's happening around you right now? I can't. I can't. It's deafening. <laughs> it is just ridiculous how I mean, much live music is happening around me at any given point. I know there's Austin City Limits, and I know Austin is a g beautiful and fantastic city, especially for the music scene, so I'll give you a break there, <laughs> but I'm from... I'm from North Carolina, and so in my mind, the music capital of the world is Nashville, Tennessee, because that's where Johnny Cash started, and that's all I care about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's... The only you know, music you, that you ever existed... Point. Music didn't exist unless it was sung by Johnny Cash. So there, there you go. Um, but awesome. Welcome, guys. It's awesome to have you back. Uh, we had a fantastic show last week. If you guys didn't get a chance to check it out, please go download it. Uh, download it a thousand times. Um, break the Apple Podcast or Stitcher Store or whatever you'd like. Destroy uh, uh, it. You have downloaded it so much because the entire world needs to hear our podcast with Talias and Evatel. They were such fantastic guests. We had such a great time with them on the show. I am very, very interested in having them back at some point. And they seem to be at least partially interested in coming back. I, I always yeah. I always feel like everyone's being polite. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, we'll be if, on your if show. If they hate us, they did a great job at hiding it. <laughs> right, exactly. It <laughs> but no, they were an absolute treasure. Um, so please, if you missed last week's podcast, go check it out um, where you can pick up all your great podcasts podcasts uh the apple Podcasts, stitcher google play um and we are even have a youtube so you can search setback podcast on youtube and hopefully find it we don't have a whole lot of plays yet so sometimes it's difficult to find but uh check our twitter as well we always send out links anyway there's our ad for the day apparently 
Um, we're going to get right into the show because we got tons of stuff to talk about. But as usual, I want to give the spoiler warning that we always give before every show. We're going to spoil everything that we can get our hands on as far as World of Warcraft is concerned. As soon as it hits the data mind, it hits shoe boots. Uh, he's got a chip planted into his brain that it just pings right off of it. And he gets a little yeah. spidey sense going on. It's called the knows. procrastination chip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so he immediately, immediately starts posting all of the information that we have. And we just want to talk about it because it's so, so super cool. So um, if you don't want to be spoiled, wait a couple months and then listen to this podcast then. Uh, but keep downloading everything. Break it. <laughs> Break it, folks. Just hold on to it like a beaver. Hold on to it. Yeah, exactly. See it in like your feed beaver. and be like, I can't wait. I can't wait to I can't wait to watch this. Um, but we've had a pretty interesting week in WoW. Patch three seven point three point five was released. I was right. I think I was right. I don't know. I, we all, was, I know right. I was right. We were all like, it could be next week. It could be the week after that. I don't know. We're going to say. Eh. I said, I, I said, I hope it's this next week. I think it's, or I hope it's this week. I think it's ready for this week. But I believe I said my money was on it not being released until next week, which that wasn't correct because it's out sort of. Right. Uh, correct. And I think it's important to note too, that uh, probably, you know, he's very proud of it. Taliesin, who was on our show, is often correct in predicting things to the point that he's made videos about it. <laughs> um, and he got it wrong. And uh, Shubut's got it right. So we'll just let that sit right there. That's true. And, That's true. We had, And there was a lot of contention in the uh, Twitch chat that week when we were talking about it. Like, no, it's going to be out then. It's going to be, it's not coming out for another month. I don't know. Um, but Shubut, <laughs> tell me a little bit about 7.3.5. Have you played it? Is it enjoyable? Um, comment. I uh, yeah. Well, of course I've I've played it, and of course at uh, at Endgame hasn't changed a whole lot aside from some glitches that had to be uh, had to be dealt with. I would say the the major change, of course, is the is the scaled world, the scaling world, and I have I have played a bit of the scaling world, mostly in dungeons, but I have ventured out a bit. Um, and what I have to say is the most interesting part of it is, first of all, um, I'm leveling on classes that I don't really play. And and I'm really enjoying it because I'm actually learning the rotation. I'm actually doing, you know, hitting more than one button to kill a mob. And that's great. But what I think is the most entertaining part of it is the general chat and the party chat where everyone declares that everything is broken and terrible now because they, are, they don't want to have to think while they're playing through the old world content. That's been my observation. It's it really is the most fun. Um, we and and especially if once I I mean we're just let's just go ahead and make this like Talius and Evatel two by the way because we talk about them every show because I'm I honestly I'm just obsessed with their channel I think I think they're great, um, but they had plenty of uh, things to say and they shared with a lot of the more interesting comments that people left on the forums about uh, about some of the issues. Um, uh, with seven point three point five, Jared, how do you feel about it? Did you like it? Are, are, are you are you enjoying it? Is it big impact, small impact? What do you think? It, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's it's probably the one thing that is like keeping me actually playing the game, and it's it 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 has reinvigorated my want to play the game so much that I actually went and got a class order hall mount this week. Oh wow! You only had you you haven't gotten one of those yet. I got I got one. Okay. I got my shaman got and I man. have five I have five tunes at, at max level. And right. this is the after about like six months I finally got or well eh, closer to five months. I get, finally got my second uh right. well, class mount. But your, your current main is a paladin and that class mount is right. basically the mount that you could buy uh, when, as a human, oh come on, that's <laughs> when, a great right. mount. When you hit level forty in Virgin, it is in, in vanilla. It is a fantastic mount because you can uh, you can glyph your uh, your steed ability to uh, to match that mount, and I absolutely love it. I was showing it off so much <laughs> in raid <Yeah>. last night. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But but aside from that, like I, I think like the biggest draw for the patch to me is is the the old world leveling because I've started not one. Not two, but three tunes, and have them all between level like twenty and sixty See, right I'm, now. I want to do that, but I also don't want to do it again 
when allied races come out because there are i'm thinking there are some of those races that i'm going to want that transmog set that you get yeah right, when you level all the way up so That's... i don't know I'm totally with you. I've been dipping my toes in just to see, but I'm not really going to full on try it out until those guys come out because I definitely want to be the first kid on my block to have a, have a semi nude uh, void elf warrior running around with a, with a right. Argus's scythe. So, uh, <laughs> right now I have my horde side, um, uh, uh, mage, my, my orc mage. Um, but he's, almost level 80 already. So I really don't get right. to take advantage of most of the content because, you know, I get to, you know, play through Cataclysm again, I guess, if I want to. Um, or right. Pandaria. Actually, that could be interesting. I would really enjoy taking him all the way through Pandaria. That would be fun. Um, I would... But yeah. I would say uh, that's the part... Those are the things I'm looking most forward to is, is um, you know, I've played the opening zones of each expansion more times than I can right, count. But I'm right. but there's a few there's a few zones I've played through. I think every zone in the game at one point or another. But there's a few that I've only played through once. Like when's the last time I went through uh, Ice Crown all the way to the end and saw the full quest line? Exactly, uh, exactly. Or um, I, for me, it's I'll, I'll probably play most of the zones or whatever. And actually, right now, even before the thing, I ended up in Sholazar Basin. And I was like, what am I right. doing here? What was this place? Was this a place? Did we go here? Like, I honestly forgot everything that was in there. It's been so long, but um, it's been um, it's been an interesting journey. And I'm in there right now. So, And I know that they changed some of this. The, with the scaling, they changed. It, it takes a little bit longer to level now, and some people are kind of mad about that. But for people who enjoy leveling, uh, yeah. it's, made it, it's made it a little bit better. I think, I think so. right. Yeah, we'll I, see. I think that's where some of the some of the anger is coming from. A lot of people have a set expectation of how long it should take them to level up, and it it just takes longer now. And yeah. if you don't care about scaling, you just want to get to max level because you're trying to get the mage tower appearances while you can or whatever. Then I could see why you'd be upset. But but by and large, this is clearly an extremely good thing for the game that like leveling up actually makes sense, and you can actually you know read through quests and see stories and be challenged. So. Right. Right. And they're saying in the chat right now that they, there are some rumors of possibly um, nerfing or, or giving buffing that experience that you get from some of these zones to make it a little bit faster, kind of find, you know, happiness in the middle. Um, but I don't know. I, you know, it is what it is. I like WoW's leveling experience to be a difficult thing, uh, or at least more difficult than, because at this point it was almost like, I just wanted to pay the $60 to, you know, get boost my character because it was a chore. It was just something, you know, there was nothing, there right. was nothing about it, yeah. but now it, I feel like I'm doing something. So, and I mean, I don't know how many times I've replayed like final fantasy seven, for example, mm -hmm. and it's the same game every time. It's just the same game, but yeah, I love replaying it. So it's one of those things. If wow, leveling could have that same, replayability factor where you just I want to do this again on another character I want to make different choices with this one you know the role play aspect of it um, right that yeah. could be interesting but the way it is the way it has been where it's just like spam dungeon runs and maybe kill a couple mobs or do one or two quests in this zone before you out level it it that was that was unfun and the reason I wanted to I would have considered spending money to just boost a tune is because there was you know it was a waste of time yeah. No fun at all. So what but, God Sego in the chat is saying that the issue is, you know how you can now choose. Do you want to go Outland or Northrend? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go MOP or Cata? Uh, what they're saying is, and this is actually the first I've heard of this, is that with the current levels, there's not enough XP in in all of Northrend to get you through those 20 levels. So, so you, you, you have, to, have go to go to Outland. Um, to some extent. I, I don't have any personal experience with that, so I don't know... Uh, just, you know, how much that is, but uh, I could see that being right. I mean, on one hand, it's not like they promised you that you'll never have to go to Outland, so it's not right. like they owe it to us. But on the other hand, I guess it would be nice if, if you could uh, do it all in one on one continent. Yeah, so. well, that's, I agree. that's also just not to say that, like, you couldn't like that. I, I think that's just taking the zones into consideration, not saying like going and doing the dungeon in each zone or dungeons in each zone as well as doing that and like kind of yeah. doing dungeons as you're going through. I think that doing all that 
and yeah. doing dungeons at the same time, you can get to, from 60 to 80 just doing one or the other. But I think just doing the, the leveling quest zones isn't enough. And that's right. that's what people are screaming about. And I but, don't know if it was intended to, well, yeah, because we want you to do dungeons too or something like that. But Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I would speculate that the most efficient way to level now, and I'm sure somebody is either figuring this out or has figured it out, but I would guess that it is queuing not for random dungeons, but specifically for each dungeon once so that you can do the quests of that dungeon. Um, and then leveling through zones while you're waiting for your queue to come up. That's my guess is going to be the most experience. And I would be surprised if doing that did not get you all the way from 60 to 80 before you hit the end of Northrend. But maybe I, I haven't, I haven't leveled through there since seven, three, five. So maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was how you leveled before this. Like, that's exactly how you leveled. Like you just picked up all the quests and all in all the zones and then you queued for specific dungeons and did the dungeon quests in each of those dungeons. And by the time you got out, you abandoned the quests that were green or gray in your quest log and then moved on to the next zone. Right. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a good uh, change overall, but we will see how it goes. I, I think that Blizzard could do some some tweak in there and I think they want to, and maybe they don't, I don't know, maybe they're happy with it, but it'll take some time before it gets to be, yeah. um, uh, exactly what it's going to be would be my wager. But let's talk a little bit about some other things. Uh, we've got the call of the scarab micro holiday event going on, which is the, uh, anniversary event for what is the encourage? Was that it? Yes. The opening of the gates of encourage. Okay. Um, yeah, so you get to uh, go into uh, what zone is that? I see. I know all the things. Shubuts, why don't you just <laughs> tell people about it? Sure. <laughs> so uh, this event happens in Silithus, and interestingly, this happens in the old version of Silithus. So, so you have if, to talk to the yeah. The, there's a there's a guy that'll change it back to the version before the events of Antorus, so that you can go there, which is great because it's actually maybe I'm in the minority, but I think it's one of the coolest zones in all of vanilla. So, um, but this was back during vanilla, uh, vanilla players will probably tell you if they were there. Um, there was the gates of on in order to open the on raid. There was a massive worldwide event where you had to gather resources. And then there was this big moment where the gates opened, but the problem was everybody went to the gates and it crashed servers like crazy. Um, I was not high enough level to see it, but I was I was there in the sense that I was in Stormwind and or out in Elwyn Forest, being attacked by uh, crazy Egyptian monsters. I guess it was a worldwide event, and then things were crashing on me, and I wasn't even in Silithus, so that's <laughs> that was my experience. Yeah, everything. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the sil the uh, um, servers caught on fire. It, I mean, it was yeah. just it was a. Uh, Pretty, pretty interesting. And so get ready for that, by the way, while Classic, whenever, if they open the gates of Encourage again, which if they're saying that Classic means Classic, <laughs> that right. means that they need to open the gates of Encourage uh, exactly the same way. And if it doesn't crash, it's not, it's not the right experience like that. I want to, I need to, <laughs> what I want to do is I want to replay those three years of my life when I was in college uh, right. You know, and and that's that's the only thing that's going to get me through. And I also just want uh, my take space an, back. Take a like, take your <laughs> Ethernet cable to my space. Right. I need my space back and Zanga. Y'all Zanga. Get some Napster going. Y'all, I would get on my Zanga and I'd be like, I'm writing a blog post today that I'm going to play some World of Warcraft. <laughs> yeah. And then listen to some music on your Zune. <laughs> no, that never happened. Come, Zune wasn't a thing. Um, I did have some sort of weird MP3 player that my dad got me for Christmas because my dad is one of those like classic dads that's like, oh, you want an iPad? All right, I'll get you. A, yeah, I, I, I my brother asked for an iPad for Christmas and he got. I swear to God, it must have been a five dollar tablet that my dad got from like right Circuit City or something. It was oh my goodness. incredible, incredible. I got a great deal. It was Black Friday. Way to go, Dad. <laughs> Gotta love him. Um, but, uh, yeah. but anyways, so this so this event basically commemorates that sort of like now iconic famous moment in WoW history and um the two sides Horde and Alliance are you can go there and compete. It might be over by now. I don't know if it no, is and it if ends, so who won. 
if you're watching the show live right now, it ends tomorrow. So you okay. can go get it tonight if and you so, really want to. And so the big deal here is if you win, if the Horde of the Alliance wins, your team's banner will fly on all servers in your region for the next year. So last year it was the Horde. The Horde banner has been flying there since last year. Um, and if the so we'll see who wins this time and if the Alliance can pull it through or if the Horde will go two years in a row. Um, I was very excited about this when they announced it, and I have to admit I barely participated at all, so I don't know what that said. Um, <laughs> right. there are Which the is why thing- the Horde win and will continually win, because Alliance players are just all self-absorbed with their own lives, and I'm not going to... I need to work on my my class mounts, Jared. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Jared. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, now, they did add a couple <laughs> mounts this year, a red and a blue... Uh, what do you call them? Silithid kind of Karaji yeah. guy? Yes, um, yes. But they are not actual mounts that like contribute to your collection. They're sort of like the brooms you get at Halloween. They're... Uh, as I understand, they're items you just sort of get in your inventory that you can use during the event, and then they—I don't know if they go away, but you can't use them when it's not the when the event's over. So, but check that event out; it's going to be awesome. We're going to move on a little bit to some news that we got about sh- a shadow rune or shadow runes in Orgrammar or a, a or, <laughs> or shadow rune in Orgrammar. Jared, what's up, man? Okay, so someone found something. In the in the live server shortly after 7.3.5 launched, I'm gonna open the link up. But basically, uh, they're prepared, in but... Orgamar, uh, in in the uh, the Orgamar embassy, I think. Um, there on the ground is a uh, is a shadow rune that uh, that showed up, and you can only see it if you're looking through a telescope at the embassy and it's got some, uh, some pretty heavy, uh, implications. Um, mostly because these in... are the same shadow runes. We've seen these shadow runes before. Right. Uh, the latest, the latest, yes, exactly. The latest that we saw the shadow rune, uh, was in, uh, Makari. Um, when we were, who, what is his name? Um, good grief. Anyway, we found one in, in uh, in Makari, and uh, it, it had something to do with some some dude that we killed. <laughs> right. It was the broken. I can't remember, but it was the broken that uh, we found with Illyria. Uh, right. All of the broken were going kind of nutso over there. And Illyria is trying to help us out. It, But it goes. It follows that storyline of the void. Right. The void uh, gods kind of uh, messing with the planetary life over there where you have the ethereals that have been there and Nexus Walker, right? Nexus Walker mm-hmm. is trying to lo- Locus locust Locus water, locust Walker. Thank you. Uh, locust Walker. L- locust Walker is trying to um, locust water. <laughs> locust water is, uh, you know, helping you out and helping uh, Illyria get all cool and voidy or whatever. But um, yeah, it looks to be that, uh, that same symbol that they were worshiping, like this void something rune of uh, heralding their coming, or are they like, you know, well, the, bloods, the bloods and the crypts and tagging? What do you think, Jared? Kind of. I think, that, well, this, this Wildhead article uh, uh, is basically saying that this is uh, alluding to the fact that, uh, that Gallywix might be getting his information from a specific uh, sub race, um, or not sub race, but uh, a, a particular you know race of beings called the the Void uh, people. Is that what they're the, called? The Are they void, called void people. The Void people. I haven't data mined that. Shoe boots. Did your did your chip go off? <laughs> yeah, the Void they're, people. They're a, ba- they're a band from the seventies. The, <laughs> the Void people. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but the the implication is that he's they have he's a song called S I Seven. S I Seven. It's fun to stay at the S I Seven. If you guys don't watch the video, I just did the whole S I Seven dance because it's a thing. Um, so go to Real YouTube, thing. YouTube slash Setback Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, interesting. It's, it's a pretty massive implication that uh, that he's he's colluding with with Void 
uh, beings to, and, to get information to uh, further accelerate the uh, the story that we've got going in to uh, Battle for Azeroth. Right. You're and I know about Gallywix there. Gally yeah, Gallywix. Yeah. Specifically Gallywix. So, yeah, I watched this video and I encourage everyone to do it. This video is made by it's on uh, Wowhead. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's made by a guy called Pyromancer, who I shout out to Pyromancer. I love Pyromancer. I've been watching his videos for years, actually. He's one of my favorite uh, warlock tutorial makers, and he's recently started to make a lot of lore videos. And I love his lore videos, uh, mainly because, and I say this lovingly, I never agree with his predictions. I think I think I'm always <laughs> like, "What the hell are you talking about, man?" But uh, uh, yeah, so he was talking about Gallywix. I think this has nothing to do with Gallywix. I think this has a lot to do with and admit. And I I got to roll a horde tuner or grab one and go and check this out. I want to see exactly where this thing's pointing at because I think this has a lot to do with the shadow that's been beneath Orgrimmar since the beginning of WoW. That that area the entrance to ragefire chasm ragefire chasm yeah yeah the um, what's that what's that place called uh the, the crypt or the shadow the, cavern some, or something yeah something mm -hmm. but you go in there and that's where like the warlock trainer is and the drag the drag and then you uh and then that's where like the dark shaman were up to no good in in siege of orgrimmar that was right. the way into the darker areas of siege of orgrimmar which is we now know a very old god situation. I think it has a lot more to do with that than than Gallywix, but uh, uh, I don't know. We'll see. We might both be right. Who knows? I I still we sure think, don't. <laughs> and we're gonna go back into this, of course, but uh, at a few, later date. But when Battle for Azeroth was announced, I never, I like, I understood. Oh, we're going back to PvP, kind of centered Horde versus Alliance. That's awesome. But I really don't think that's. I I am as certain as an uncertain person possibly can be <laughs> that <laughs> battle for Azeroth is talking about the actual battle for the soul of Azeroth. Like it's going to be old guys. It's going to have these, all these little clues are happening. I don't know how far in depth we get, but this is at least the introduction to the new saga where it feels like, wow, up to this point has been so kind of Legion focused. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, where maybe not so much um, uh, in Missa Pandaria, but definitely Warlords of Draenor was Legion influence. Gul'dan, like absolutely. Um, Missa Vandaria, not so much. It was more Void, um, but uh, and the same with uh, Cataclysm was kind of more dealing with the Void. But Wrath of the Lich King, you know, the Lich King got his power from the Legion. Uh, the uh, Burning Crusade, obviously. I don't know. I we'll see. There it is. We'll there see. There it is. But that's my that's my prediction, and that's what I think this is coming from too. But we got to move on again. Uh, let's uh, let's go on. We already talked about level scaling a little bit, but uh, got some news. What Shubas, you posted this. Your your chip went off. Uh, yeah. Maybe yesterday, as you were you were uh, just strolling along throughout. Um, Stormwind, Storm wind, but yeah, yeah, what's going on in Stormwind? So I was strutting around on my level 15 Frost Mage in Stormwind uh, as I was going to as, check as out some of that level scaling. Uh, by yeah. the way, and, by the way, pro tip, um, and I don't know, maybe it's different with the level scaling, but as an arcane mage, like as you're leveling, you can one shot ev like everything. Literally forever. everything. Like um, it's ridiculous. But and I think even it's so OP, like when you get all your stacks up. Uh, even now, I bet you can you can make pretty easy work of mobs. But there you go. Pro tip. Frost is my That's, favorite spec, so play what yeah, you want. I'll think but. about it. The thing is, I rolled this guy on an RP server, and he's kind of... Uh, he's based on the voice I do of Droopy the dog, and he... <sighs> He complains about his hands being cold all the time. So I think he needs oh to be God. a frost mage. <laughs> That's the Fine. best thing I've ever heard. We can, we, I, you, I feel like we have to end the show now, like yeah. permanently, because that is. That's the finale for merely a setback, folks. Thanks for being our fans. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, what's going on in Stormwind? So if you go through the gates of Stormwind, right at the base of the statue of Illyria, there is the real Illyria and Torellian, and they are they're visiting their own memorials of their presumed death that are built in the entrance of uh, of Stormwind. And uh, if you go there, you can listen in on a conversation that they have. And uh, what is what is most important is uh, something that Illyria says. 
just pulling it up right now. I, ac- I had it open. I accidentally closed it. Sorry. Here we go. So they're talking, and Illyria says, um, quote, Sometimes I feel that I've already died twice. Once when we were presumed lost on Draenor, and again when gripped by the shadow of the fallen Naru. And for anyone that uh, is either listening to our show or, or followed any of the, the numerous fan creations speculating on the whispers of Ilganoth and what they mean, you're immediately queuing in on that idea of her saying she's uh, <laughs> already died twice. And if you're Jared, what you're realizing... What you're watching right now, I everyone, is it. that he got it for the first... <laughs> We've been talking about this... <laughs> For like, we, I remember. I'm pretty sure we brought this up on the show before, or at least convert to we raid. Did. Oh we my did. god, we Jared! It up last week. Jared's like <laughs> slapping his cheeks, like he just realized he forgot his son Kevin at home while going on a trip. You actually, family. once again, go download the video of this show. <laughs> he just lost it. Thank God your so, camera didn't go out there. Keep going. So this, oh, this is a oh huge man. deal because of the Ilganoth whisper that everybody, well, I say everybody, everybody in this community has been speculating who's the person at the hour of her third death she ushers in a new coming. And, you know, there's been speculation, is this Azeroth herself? Is this Sylvanas? Is this... And Illyria has been in the running, but you not high in the running. This claim puts her pretty high in the running. And if she is in the running, what is her third death? Um, now, the two deaths that she's, she mentions are figurative. They're not literal. So the, her third death could really be anything. Um, alternatively, this could just be Blizzard baiting us and knowing that we're just going to freak out when we see that. And it could be somebody else altogether. But either way, this is, uh, this is I, I think this is so far the most interesting part of 735 is this one little conversation that Illyria and Turalyon have. Because if if it is Illyria, and is she ushering in the coming of the void? Is she? Because I like to believe that she's got a handle on this thing, and she's going to be on our side for the long term. But maybe not. Maybe something else is going on there. Is is the void, and is Ilganoth necessarily evil? Though maybe she willingly ushers in their third coming sacrifices herself to the void gods or something to usher in the happy void. Because what we've seen is that the light has always been presumed to be good, but we've seen with Illidan's interaction with the Naru that that's not necessarily true. They're pretty shady. (laughs) That's a pun. No, Um, no. (laughs) I got it. I got it. The light is shady. Um, anyway, uh, but, uh, Stop it. so you have that and then you also, so in conversely, possibly there is an ushering of, uh, our, our, uh, she ushers in our coming and that is these void entities that are not inherently evil. Um, you know, kind of maybe most void is evil, but that doesn't mean all void are evil. Who knows? So. It's, it, I mean, we I have mean, we could say anything, <laughs> but yeah, right. We, we, we the... kind of have proof that that there are void entities that aren't pure evil, and that is uh, characterized by the Locust Walker, right. Locust Water, and Illyria herself. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I think it, it it's plausible. Uh, our uh, the shadow the shadow um, shadow priest dagger. I don't know right. if I would say is inherently evil. Definitely dark. Shadow, shadow priests. Shadow, Naifu. shadow priests themselves. Yeah, Naifu. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, which that's the saddest part about us losing our... No, just kidding. That's the second saddest part about our inevitable losing of our legendary weapons. The saddest part, and I really... We should do a whole deep dive on this, but I need Blizzard to 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 not kill Hattie. Like, I don't know if I can handle that. Okay, I, guys, yeah. like the Hattie, if you don't know, the Beastmaster's Titan Strike weapon is connected to the soul of uh, your basically kind of like your second pet, right? Um, named Hattie. And you can make Hattie look what, like whatever you want him to look like. But, but Hattie, you shouldn't. Right? Because it's, it's, he should just be, you know, your, your spirit doggy. Um, 
But especially like Hannah plays uh, Beastmaster Hunter and will only play Beastmaster Hunter. It doesn't matter if Beastmaster Hunters are the worst ever and doing half the damage of tanks uh, like on the top parses. She's still going to play Beastmaster Hunter um, because pets are cute and fuzzy. But anyway, and so the, <laughs> the, the thought of losing Hattie for her is actually traumatizing. I had to calm her down the other night. <laughs> when she realized she was losing the weapon and realized that Hattie was connected to the weapon and she was just not okay with it. And there is actually a big hunter community right now that's that's like Blizzard, There's... please don't get rid of Hattie. Please do something do something with Hattie. Like find a yeah. way to bind its spirit to us as the hunt like do some anything. Um, right. Yeah, he's we'll there's I'm strongly in support of this. I have a max level hunter that I don't play very much, but I do play in Beastmaster. And I think Hattie is awesome and it it's they've got to do something um i would suggest just make a little side thing where he becomes free of the weapon and he's just a pet that's in your inventory moving right. forward but or just I let love, go ahead sorry yeah just or... let oh i was just gonna say just let people have hattie it's uh it's just a super cool thing that they did and it would just be so sad to take it away and just unnecessarily sad like i don't understand yeah. why they can't bind hattie to the hunter's soul and your first uh tier uh talent tier there's an option to you know release hattie you know what i mean like to yeah. do that 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 you have hattie in your soul somewhere and if you don't want to use a second pet or whatever you don't have to but one of the talents is you can release hattie uh who has been bound to your soul and then uh and and now you have sec two pets just like the way that beastmasters played currently which and that's the other thing. Do they want Beastmasters to have two pets anymore, or make it an option? I think if I'm a dev, I would say make it an option, the same way that you made uh, a pet for Frost Mages an option that was viable and still, arguably is. Frozen Winter is still probably better, uh, you, you know. Yeah, on I top. like that. But at the but same just... time, you can still do great DPS with your Frost Elemental. You know, so I don't know. I think that's great. I board. think so, too. Yeah, we got to move on. There's so much stuff talking about the news, but we're going to move on right. from the news. And we've had a lot of discussion on kind of what we want to do um, with this week's episode. How are we going to follow last week with uh, Talias and Avatel, who were once again just so incredible? Um, but we decided that we want to do a deep dive into King Anduin Wren. We spent a lot of time talking about the Horde. We spent a little bit of time last week talking about Jaina. Uh, quite a bit of time. Um, but Jaina, you know, I she's definitely an Alliance character now. But you can argue that her history, at least, she's very neutral. And uh, earlier in her history, she was very Horde side. Um, you know, her war, so, the Warcraft. That was the rumor. Jaina. It was. Yeah. Oh, she was. She. I mean, like she was a. She was an agent of the Horde. And she ushered them in to have them murder her father. Uh, so, I, mm, but anyway, <laughs> let's talk about our Lord and Savior Anduin Wren a little bit. Um, Jared, why don't you get us started and tell us a little bit about what we know about the history. Of Anduin Wynn, briefly. <laughs> so, okay, so I've got a lot of notes on, on the history of Anduin Wren, but uh, what, what let, let's just start from the beginning. Uh, so he became King of Stormwind at the age, the ripe old age of 10, uh, when his father was captured by who we would later learn uh, is Onyxia, the dragon. Uh, and he uh, kind of ruled... Uh, with uh, with Bolvar Four Dragon being uh, kind of the steward of Stormwind um, in Varian's absence, um, and basically was ruling Stormwind uh, until Anduin became of age. Um, before that could happen, though, uh, Varian showed back up and was basically like crazy and started doing a whole bunch of stuff that was very uncharacteristic of of his kinghood uh, and everyone was very confused Anduin most of all who thought his dad was like this very like stand up guy uh, and didn't see him in any bad light whatsoever and 
then another version of his dad shows up sometime later uh, under the name Logash, uh, which we can get into in an episode about Varian because there's a, there's so much to talk about Varian. Oh my gosh. Um, Right. <laughs> All right. Low, on. no, you didn't. <laughs> Low, no, I didn't. Low, yes, I did. Gosh. Oh, good grief. So much. Okay. Whew. Jared, you're <laughs> stalling. I know. I know. I'm trying to catch my breath. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, anyways, long story short, uh, Varian, this weird version of Varian and Logash team up together to go save uh, their son Anduin, who was captured by Anixia after Varian returned, um, and they became one kind of. Uh, I don't know exactly how that worked, but we can go into it later. Um, but yeah, after that, uh, Anduin presumed his princehood uh, and started training his uh, his priesthood under Velen the Prophet, um, and yeah. Yeah, that's that is the short and sweet version. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> the very, thanks for the old the very college short, try. The uh, the the crash course. But, version yeah, into was. into who Anduin was, and that's who he was. Especially we knew him as like I first met Anduin as the boy king, right? Welcome to Stormwind, right? Um, and uh, upon his father's return, though, we see. Uh, in different aspects of the lore, in the game, in uh, 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 stories and novels and comic strips, um, there's this sense that Anduin is not uh, Anduin is not living up to his father's expectations, right? Shoe boots. Yeah, he um, and and to be clear, it's not that he's a slacker. He's He's having trouble living up to the the warrior that his father wants him to be and and perhaps that the kingdom wants him to be. But he is going through a lot of really major moments um, as, as a prince. And a lot of these moments are covered in the books, uh, such as the shattering, as in war crimes, uh, tides of war. I mean, Anduin is a boy prince, but after his father returns, he's learning about the light. He's secretly meeting with the Horde, with Jaina, meeting Bane, uh, and, and you know, negotiating peace long before he's ever the king. He's, uh, he's encountering Garrosh Hellscream one-on-one during Mists of Pandaria, and this is in the game. You can play through this, you can play through this uh, storyline. It's the Landfall campaign in Mists of Pandaria, where uh, Garrosh almost kills Anduin, shatters every bone in his body, and uh, and Velen heals him. But he's he's doing a lot of really impressive things that that only a like a brave and um, um, what would I say? He's he's got his morals. Like he knows what he stands for, and he stands for them. And his his real problem is that is that they're not necessarily what his father stands for. And we see a lot of this, um, you know, Jared touched on it. The We see a lot of this in Mists of Pandaria. Uh, in many ways, if you play the Alliance campaign in Mists of Pandaria, the story is about Anduin and him uh, teaching his father um, and learning from his father, but them learning from each other. Um, you know, Varian's learning tolerance from his son and Anduin's learning to to fight when you need to from his father. So um, there's a lot going on there if if you look for it. But what I guess what I'm getting at is don't buy into the idea that he's just a weenie. If you like, if you hear this idea, it's just not true. For example, yes, on our podcast earlier, uh, a couple episodes ago, where I said it, probably, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably so. Probably, yeah, and we most have, likely uh, we have a lot uh, to talk about about Anduin. There's um, also, you know, just recently with his father's death uh, at the hands of Gul'dan at the beginning of Legion, like taking over the throne. Um, the, I mean, just uh, imagine you're a ten year old kid whose father, who's been told your father's dead, which sucks already. Right, your dad mm-hmm. dies. That's that's and your pretty... and your mother and you never knew your mother. You she died your when mother. you were a baby. Right, and so you're an orphan, which is awful. But you're also at ten years old now, in charge of a kingdom. 
you're an orphan king that has had no training, no understanding, and especially at that time, arguably not really the um what's the word I'm looking for? It's not gumption, but desire or you're not prepared. He is yeah. not prepared, right? Uh, God, that was terrible. <laughs> Anyone from the Blizzard voice acting team that heard that, please disregard. I'm better than that. Give me a call. Uh, I'll let you get in touch with my agent. Uh, shoot us an email. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> after that audition. Wow. Uh, but yeah, just it's, I don't know, it's incredible. So you have that. And then several years later, Daddy comes home changed because he's kind of nutso. He was sort of two people at, you know what I mean? And somehow has regained his composure enough to be the king again, reassumes the throne and is just disappointed in you as far right. as uh, maybe not just disappointed, but I mean, he's now he's like, okay, I'm back. And if something like that happens to you and I need to train my son to be the king and to be a warrior and this and that and the other, and you're just not, you're not that. And you see that even though he might have still been a loving and understanding father as much as he could be, but there's still, you know, that he's, he's, you're, you're not, you're not cutting it. You're not what he thinks he needs you're not what he needs mm -hmm. you're not what the country's going to need oh my god what happens ultimately my dad is going to die and i'm going to take over again what am i and that's going through your head and then you feel and he does decide to train under velen right which is pretty interesting um and as far as life choices go for a king to be training in the priesthood Right. Um, Out of all the priests that he could have possibly chosen oh, yeah. to train him, he went with Velen. He picked the uh, most BA priest, definitely. So yeah, right. but he he's also. I mean, you got to remember, Stormwind is the home of the the best human priests in the world, right? You've got the cathedral there. He could have stayed home. He could have stayed near his dad, and uh, and he didn't. He went to this crazy alien guy who lives in a crashed ship on the other side of the world. Right. And uh, um, that is also another choice that was probably very difficult and required bravery on his part. And probably wasn't a th thriller to Papa. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I think it explicitly wasn't. I think there's a novelization about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's we could keep going, but let's kind of try and break some of this down a little bit and talk a little bit about where, now that we have sort of an understanding of where Anduin is coming from, there was something, I want to just jump right to it, because Shoeboots, you posted maybe 15 minutes before I started the show, um, a web comic that, yes. is that in the notes? By the way, um, I don't know if it's on the notes. It's okay. on our Discord chat. Yeah, but, that's uh, that's fine. And I I, I, is... I read it already. But w when was that? Was that just? Did that just come out? No, this came out uh, around the launch of Legion. Some of you might recall a series of comics came out. They're all on World of Warcraft's website. How you did can I go... miss this? Uh, I don't I remember... know, but there's some. <laughs> I, mean, I remember I... reading some of the comics, but I don't remember this one. I'm no, I'm a bad person. Yeah. Just straight uh, up. If you I haven't mean, read these I, comics, you're bad people. And we'll try to get you the link. We'll try to tweet it out. So pay attention yeah. to our Twitter. But keep going. But, but you don't even need the link because you just go to worldofwarcraft.com, click on story, click on comics. They're all right there. Great. Um, but there's one in particular. It's the, the fourth Legion comic, and it's about Anduin. And this comic takes place in Stormwind. Um, I'm going to guess that it takes place sometime around the events of between seven, two and seven, three, because he's got Chalamet in the comic. And we didn't make much of that at the time, but we now know that he, he got his father's sword when he returned to the broken shore. Right. Um, now he's in Stormwind, and he's attacked by a demon. A demon tries to take his life, but he captures the demon with his, with his priest powers and has a conversation with the demon. And, um, I'll just skip right to the end. What's important about this ultimately is the demon offers him a chance to spare the Alliance, to please join us. 
um, and will and you can be our subjects, and your people will not have to die. We'll give you the peace that you've looked for. Logash, uh, the, the he calls him the wolf, right? The wolf is yeah. dead. The warrior is dead, and the only thing war will bring you is death. And we have been watching, and we know that you want peace. We can give you the peace that you want. You have to join us, right? And then what right. happens to? So uh, he uh, fortunately says no. And he he kills he kills the demon and and he has a moment of a moment of strength I guess you could say a moment where he kind of takes from his father the the strength to do what a king must do, um, but what's probably the most mind blowing is the very last page of the comic shows I believe the caption says many many years later, and it shows what appears to be the Exodar. And Velen is there, and Anduin is there, and Anduin is an old man. He's in his sixties or seventies, and 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 Velen is telling him he it's calls time. Him, he calls him High High King Ren. High King he Ren. Says, High King Ren. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> he's not saying High King Ren. No. Hi, H-I-G-H, High H I G H. Like yeah. stoned stoned <laughs> King Ren. Hey, yeah. High King Ren. No, sorry. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so he says the moment of our last. This is the moment of our of our final battle. And what I think, I didn't pick up on the time, but as I was kind of reading about it today, what I think is most interesting about this is the last line, which wouldn't have meant much of to us in uh, 2016, but it certainly means a lot now. And that is his, his final line where he says that he's fighting the shadow, the last battle with the shadow. And I don't, I sadly don't have it in front of me, but, uh, you know, I assumed he was talking about the Legion when I read that, because at the time it hadn't occurred to me that we're actually going to be ending the Legion in Legion, right? I thought that this was um, this was about that. But he's speaking of the shadow, which has a totally different meaning to me now. And so this tells us a few things. First of all, it tells us that Anduin and Velen, saving for a massive retcon, are going to be around for a long time. They're not going to die anytime soon. Now, that's not to say that they're not going to go away for times and come back. Um, it also tells us that the shadow is going to be an enemy for a long time, failing some crazy retcon. Um, I think this is a really big deal. And I think that this is uh, something that's way too overlooked right now in all the speculation that's going on. Right. Yeah. If this is canon, which it is, this is on the World of Warcraft page. This is their story uh, team has brought this together means that this establishes unless they time travel again which oh my god ian <laughs> ian don't do it if you don't do it man. just i um, have we learned nothing <laughs> ian please uh, just don't do it i, just, I love you too much it. to hate you but i i would i think i might that might be what that might be what sends me over the edge and just tear me in two and I'll and I'll become this you know logosh creature that doesn't know where he is, um, because you have enslaved my soul by time travel. But um, what is happening right now? But yeah, this establishes that he's going to be around into his old age, unless for some reason this is a well, you, unless he's artificially is, aged. Like, well, I'm thinking like maybe Adnar. this is a this is this might be a many 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 years later, and it is a descendant of Anduin Wren named Anduin Wren, just like oh, Anduin. An interesting and well, Anduin is named after Anduin Lothar. Yeah, right. Which is his great uncle, right? I I don't know the, that there's a relation the, in the. the in okay. the movie universe, there's a relationship, but in the actual Warcraft universe, he's just uh, a personal friend. Okay, yeah. and I don't know. I don't know how. I feel like the movie. I don't know. I, I I'm speaking in terms of canon, right? Which is kind of weird, I guess. But I feel Blizzard at least gave the thumbs up to the movie. Like they were. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I but don't they know. Also, they they definitely doubled down on the universes being separate because in Chronicle Ep, uh, Volume Two. There's a painting of the Lothar of the regular universe guiding, um, okay. and Lothar. You know, in the movie, Lothar is the sexy Viking guy that uh, is all hot and bothered. But in the in the work, real Warcraft universe, Anna Lothar is an old man. He's the same age as uh, as Medivh and of King Lane Rin. Well, and they and they 
they should have been. Yeah, and they're all the supposed movie, to be they're, old. They're all young. Yeah, yeah exactly. But right. yeah, I think DK Rice says in the chat they're best buds and grew up together with Medivh. That makes sense. But either way, he was uh, he was named after him. It makes sense that, especially if Anduin is either martyred or becomes a great ruler, or that you would name you know, a future king after him. So I don't know. Um, I think it, it makes more sense. I think it makes more sense that it's just Anduin as an old man. Um, there's, like I said, there's, there's your first way out of it. I'm sure you can think of other ways out of it that don't involve time travel blizzard. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, a, a long descendants sense, a good. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense that this is, and he talks about, he says, there's all, this is, I, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, we'll never have a, Velen says, we'll never have a better opportunity to strike, nor will we ever have another chance. High mm-hmm. King Anduin Wren replies, this is the only chance we need for my father and for the countless others who have fallen. And hey, yeah. that's I'm, when, you're... so he refers to his father, which we're assuming to be, um, um, Varian. Varian. And he says, and then Velen says, the light will triumph over the shadow this day, is the direct quote that Varian says. So I don't know. It's, uh, it, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And, and I do it think is. what, but what kind of, it kind of hurt me a little bit because I'm like, I just want to fight the void now. And I know we're not going to completely ever destroy the void. No, probably just like how just like the you? light will never be. You can't completely, completely destroyed. right. It's like as long as there's one, there's always going to be the other. And without any of them, there's nothing kind right. of like the light and the shadow are just the thing that's always there. You can't not have light and shadow unless if you uh, unless you cease to exist, mm-hmm. right. so, at least the way that I sort of see it. But um, but yeah, it's an it's an interesting Interesting glimpse into the future that just now that we have finished the Legion storyline and we know that they're not talking about the Exodus or they're not talking about the Legion, at least not the Legion as we know it. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm already predicting right now we're going to see the Legion again. Everybody's like, no, we've destroyed the Legion and maybe it won't be called the Legion. But spoiler alert, I am pretty sure that Sargeras is going to figure out a way to escape. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. It's just going to happen. There's no way you have some a big baddie like Sargeras so you don't see him again. How many times have we seen Illidan on the good side Twice. and the bad side? Right? No, we've seen he was back in Warcraft three. So oh, we've, both. we've seen yeah, him. Three yeah, times. you know what I mean. Like, we've seen how 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 many times have we seen Arthas? I'm not a hundred percent sure Arthas isn't going to come back at some time. Honestly, <laughs> I'm not. Well, no, no, because we destroyed his soul within uh, within his sword. Uh, sure, we did. Rossborn. Oh, we wait. did. We did. That's you how mean, we got the shards. You to mean you mean construct. the swords that the Frost Death Knights are using now? That sword? Yeah, that that sword. I know. I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you, Blizzard, you can do I, when you're creating the world and you're creating the, the story. Lich King, the Lich King will be back. I think oh, the Lich King already is back. The Lich King is Bolvar now, and he'll right. be, he'll be a baddie again. I'm sure, but I don't know. I I, I, I don't. I'm just saying I, think, I don't I don't honestly think that Arthas will coming back will be coming back. I'm just saying that <laughs> Blizzard can do literally anything they want to. Warlords of Draenor is proof of that and also proof that maybe it's not always a good thing. So keep that in mind. But well, yeah. uh, go ahead. Uh, she was you had something to say. Yeah, I think this is um like one thing Blizzard's gotten really good at, especially in the last few expansions, is is that they've learned how to write an MMO. And the way that you write an MMO is you put things on the shelf, right? You you take ideas and you put them on the shelf so that you can take them off the shelf later on. And it's incredibly satisfying to to the fans to take something off the shelf that's been up there for a long time. That's why we were all so happy when Illidan came back to the game. And absolutely, it's totally their option to do anything they want with the Titans again, with Illidan again, 
with Sargeras again. All of those things are just on the right. shelf now. And we, and the longer that they stay up there, the more exciting it's going to be for all of us when they're when they're taken off that shelf. Well, it's the same uh, excitement with Terrellian and Illyria coming back. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like, fans of the the you know of those characters that have been that played Warcraft two and played through that and now are getting you know teased that oh my god they're coming back they're coming back. Um, how much excitement was that? And so, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. You're hundred percent right. Yeah. But I do think that uh, the void is here to stay for the time being. I, I feel like, you know, the burning Legion is what in my mind, I kind of categorize as, as the Metzen era of, of storytelling, you know, Metzen is, and to be fair, like Metzen is long gone as the lead story writer of world of Warcraft. He yes, actually he re- posted, he tweeted today about how, while he's recovering, by the way, PS, uh, shout out to Chris Metzen, who uh, recently had um, back surgery, spine surgery on his spine, uh, mm-hmm. and is recovering uh, well. So awesome, man. Keep it up. Uh, you're my hero. I saw you at BlizzCon, and you were with your family, so I didn't say anything. But I saw you. And so here's a virtual hug, because I didn't want to bother you at BlizzCon. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and I looked for you at BlizzCon and fantasized about not bothering you. About fa- yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> That's actually probably a bigger thing. That's, it takes a bigger man to fantasize about not bothering someone, I think. Um, but he even said, like, it was fun because he tweeted that w- w- during recovery he was playing through Legion. And he's like, hands down, the best the best expansion ever in his opinion. And this is the first, and he, he goes on later to say, um, I wasn't, I was involved in the beginning, like some of the brainstorming and getting things yeah. started, but he's like, I didn't see the story develop. And now that I'm watching what, you know, those ideas I had became, it was yeah. incredible. And I can't wait for the next chapter. So he's not even in it anymore. Um, yeah. Which and is I think really he, interesting. for, you know, even though he only retired, I don't know if it's a year and a half ago or whatever, but even though he retired yeah. then, uh, from what I gather, he was just kind of signing off on the WoW storyline, and it was really other people that were writing it. He was far more uh, involved in developing Overwatch's storyline for the last few years. Right. Um, but these characters, Sargeras, uh, you know, Kill Jaden, Illidan, these are his characters, and I really feel like whether they're doing it because he retired or not, I don't know, but they're putting the, these characters to bed. And I've heard a lot of people Thrall start talking about one. Yeah, Thrall. And it's not to say we're never going to hear from these characters again, but the large arc, the impossible ultimate enemy has always been Sargeras, and now he's done. So we need a new impossible enemy. And I think that is uh, going to be, it seems to me that Alex Afraziabi, who's been a, uh, involved in writing the WoW storyline for a long time. He's not new to this. He was, as far as I understand, second in command when Metzen was was writing it. Um, we're in his era now, and it seems to me that he is ready to put these old stories to bed and write the story that he wants to tell. Yeah. And it's and that is the story of the Void. And I think that I I'm hopeful actually that the Void is going to be a really slow, long, developing story that's going to happen over several expansions, if not for as long as the Burning Legion has been around. Well, and I see it as... Uh, he, with their, uh, I don't know. I'm going to... I always connect everything in my life to Star Wars. Like, everything has to go through what should be probably called the Star Wars filter, as far as Sharku's concerned. <laughs> like, you know, everything I'm like, and how does that relate to the real world, which is Star Wars? But um, but what they seem to be doing with this light versus dark thing is that's the light side and the dark side. Like, almost exactly. They're almost interchangeable if you look at the two universes of Star Wars and, and Azeroth, uh, World of Warcraft. It's this I concept. And now we have even the concept that maybe the light isn't all good. Maybe the Jedi weren't all good. Maybe the dark isn't all bad. Maybe the Sith aren't all bad. Like, it's mm-hmm. almost completely... And, and the best part about that kind of storyline and what's brilliant about it is that you never... You don't have an impossible adversary like Sargeras. You don't have a big bad that you can never really fully defeat you know you don't have your you know shredder or lord krang or whatever we're just going to talk about all the geeky stuff i used to watch as a kid tonight by the way 
but you know, beastly and no heart. Sure, yeah, exactly. You don't have these big arch villains. You have obstacles and evil to overcome. But the real struggle is this struggle. There's the struggle of the light and the dark, but there's also the struggle of good and evil, where you can have good light or evil light, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, or a good uh, shadow or evil shadow. And that struggle, with that being the big bad, if we're trying to be good, whether we're on the Horde or the Alliance, but we're ultimately good characters, or at least neutral characters that don't wish evil upon others, then we're just in constant battle with anyone that's evil, people we haven't heard of yet, you know, uh, right. and that are going to become more and more and more powerful. Uh, rather than having to do something like maybe Dragon Ball Z, where you have to keep finding more and more and more powerful ultimate evils because Goku keeps killing all of the impossible to defeat bad guys, right? Uh, right. So, but here we don't, they don't have to necessarily be, become more and more bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's just a struggle between good and evil and whatever comes our way. Yeah, they're going to be hard to defeat, but we defeated this guy. Maybe if we band together the way we did before, we can defeat this new thing too. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's uh, very interesting. You can, my point is you can go literally anywhere with it. There is no end to Warcraft, and that's what this universe needs to have. Like that's He's setting it up to be that eternal story that never has to end, where I think when it was originally set up, the idea was, yeah, we're going to end it sometime, and it'll be with Sargeras. Mm -hmm. Right. But, well, but it never, it back... never, you know. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Jared. <laughs> Getting back to Anduin and this this idea of, uh, of nothing is nothing is binary uh, or nothing is as binary as we think it is. Um, I think I think we've got a lot of room in Battle for Azeroth and uh, and subsequent uh, subsequent expansions to see Anduin not be who we've known him to be for the last uh, what. 12, 13 years now <laughs> uh, of being this very like not one dimensional per se, but very, uh, very lawful peace loving person guy that, that just strives to, to get, uh, to get everyone to, to love and, and make up with, with each other and not fight so much. Uh, I think, I think now is the shift that we're going to see. And if you haven't seen, uh, if you haven't logged into WoW this week um, after 7.3.5 dropped and seen the uh, the cutscenes for uh, for this new patch, uh, both the Alliance and and the Horde cutscenes are very 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 awesome and good and you should watch them <laughs> right now if you haven't uh but yeah. we're talking about anduin right now in this episode so i'm going to talk about the alliance cinematic um wherein uh we see we see a little bit of a of a hesitant king we see the the boy king give a rousing well i'll say this we see the man king uh give a rousing speech and then kind of kind of like scuffle back to his to his uh to his old ways um uh, i guess you could say um and whenever whenever his uh his spy master hands him a piece of of rock that starts glowing uh in his hand he doesn't know what to do and looks to none other than gen graymane for approval which i think is something incredible because it's showing us that he is still unsure. He's still very unsure of his kingship. He doesn't know what to do. Because he's a whiny little so bitch. Oh. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Sharku. Sharku, this is a children's show. It's, not a, it's a family <laughs> show, and I'm allowed to curse three times uh, and not get banned by Twitch. So there was That's one. True. There was one. I censored myself a couple times earlier, by the way. So I decided I chose wisely as to when to use my profanity. Um, but yeah, yeah. I I just thought it's 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 good. It's good to see 
to see that that hesitance that he had. It is interesting, and let's and I mean we could go all sorts of places. Let's keep going with this though. And Shuboots, that the how do you feel with the accusation that your man king says Jared uh, is still hesitant to rule? Is still up until this point he's constantly looking to Velen, and now Velen's on vacation because the Legion's gone, and he can you know not constantly be looking over his shoulder. Um, now he's just turning to Greymane every time. He's not making any decisions for himself. What do you think? I don't buy it. I think uh, I think everyone's reading way too much into him looking over to Greymane. I think he's looking over to Greymane because Greymane already saw it. <laughs> like I don't. I just think it's just a natural thing that you would do. It's not meaning that you can't make decisions about anything in fact he makes decisions about it immediately after um i think that the story of anduin is that he's become his own man and and i hope that they don't continue down this road of questioning themselves after they've gone uh, after he's gone they've gone to so much trouble to show that he no longer needs to i think um now granted this happens in the future compared to the 735 cutscene, but the Battle for Azeroth cinematic very much communicates that Anduin is his own is his own man and that he is not doing things based on anyone else's suggestion or approval. He's doing what he he feels is right. So I don't I don't personally buy into it. I think uh, I think when he looks at it, I think there's just a lot of similarity with uh, the Sylvanas and uh you know Sylvanas and Anduin have in my opinion almost identical reactions to to this concept um of course Anduin is not at the worst dinner party ever when he's uh <laughs> finding out about the uh, am I the only one that thought that just looked I don't know it it was, it was, it was awkward a, it was yeah, awkward like, the whole thing put some well, music on the horde like, leadership <laughs> is awkward anyway ever since Thrall left horde leadership has been awkward and like I said, I will bleed for my queen. I love Sylvanas. I loved her, and maybe it was just the cinematic hype. Let's be let's let's be honest. That cinematic right. was so good, and Sylvanas was. And we're going to talk about the cinematic uh, again here in a second, talking about Anduin. But yeah, the the horde is still. There's something going on there. I don't. I have I, I no mean, idea. But anyway, we're not really talking I'm, about the horde today. But yeah, let's right. finish this thought. I'm well established as alliance biased on this podcast, sure, sure, so sure, that's sure, fine. Yeah. But I get why the horde players, the you know, the opposites of me, loved what Sylvanas did in that in that cutscene, right? Because she was she was ruthless. Well, and that was the first I, time we saw her as a as a war chief. That at least for me, like I'm like, okay, Sylvanas is the war chief. She's an interesting character with an interesting backstory. This story could yeah. get really cool and then i saw that cinematic and i was like <gasps> war so, chief like yeah. it it was just like it was <laughs> it was great that was it but anyway but i i, I thought i was alone in thinking that because i heard from a lot of alliance players that they thought sylvanas came off of that trailer way cooler than anduin i did not agree but i i kind of was like well I'm super biased, so that's probably what's going on there. But I actually got to credit Preach of all people for pointing out why Anduin's Anduin's appearance is better, um, and it's it's not because Anduin has a more rousing battle cry, which is what if you're a horde player, probably what you want. And it's not because Anduin kills more people with his banshee form. It's because Anduin shows his character th- uh, in his scene. You know, like he looks around him. There's the attack. Uh, everyone around him is dying. Everyone's suffering. He looks around and he has that moment that we're all meant to think, oh my God, it's Anduin. He doesn't know what to do. He's a weenie. And then he looks at his father's sword and we hear the music, the theme of Varian Rin, like, ah, he looks at it and he becomes resolute and he looks at it determined. And we think, oh my God, he's going to be the warrior he was always supposed to be. But he doesn't. He drops the sword and he right. looks to the sky and he sa- and he calls down the light and he shows us all that he is his own Manduin. He is the <laughs> he is calling he is winning this war. He is fighting this battle the way that he is meant to fight it, not the way his father would have fight it, fought it. And and that to me is is and aside from like, you know, like if you're 
the tears in his eyes when he's like calling on the light, I thought was so cool. And if, if you're mocking that, I mean, I don't even know what to say to you. Like, oh, you're crying. Like, really? Is that, is that where you're at here? No wonder you're a horde player. And, uh, so <laughs> I, I feel like, like this so is pointed in- at someone else on this show. And I, and by the way, I'm not mocking Anduin for crying. And I, and, and my, my, keep no, going. I've heard I'm lots sorry. Of people, yeah, I've heard know, lots of people say that anyways, it was just an amazing moment. And, and it, and it, it, it communicated to us, or it, it, at least I think it intended to communicate to us that Anduin is here to lead. He is the leader of, of the Alliance and he deserves to be the leader of the Alliance. And I feel like that, but between that and the broken source shore cinematic that we get in seven two, we are meant to see that Anduin has grown up and he is beyond his self doubt. I think that that's been put to bed. And so it would be a shame if they continued to explore that story because I think we're ready to see the next chapter of his life. Yeah. And I will, I will say this about the cinematic, uh, last comment about the cinematic. So probably not, but go ahead. Probably, yeah, you know, a, a man can dream. All right. Uh, so, watching the cinematic, when Sylvanas gave her Bantry scream and war cry, um, I that sh- that sent a shiver down my spine. But I was literally jumping up like air punching whenever Anduin called down the light because it w- it had such more of a weight to it than than sylvanas's banshee scream that's that's all i wanted to say that's all i wanted to say and yeah well and it's we're gonna whatever jared says is <laughs> untrue because we're gonna keep talking about the cinematic probably for another half an hour but um <laughs> because it, i mean it's so good and and we're gonna focus on anduin um but to 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 I like this kind kind of compare and contrast the leaders and you guys know that you know I I'm I'm a big I, I'm a horde guy I started playing on the horde my first character was an orc warlock I, I don't know why but the horde has always pulled me in a way that the alliance never did um, I think dwarves and alliance and uh, their stories and stuff are are interesting. Um, but oh, yeah. it was never it was never, you know, I, if my faction somewhere deep down inside for some reason, because God made me that way is Horde. I don't know why. Um, but all that being said, that's why it was my heart was pounding, you know, like right. Jared was saying with the whole because I never honestly. And even though I was a Horde in disguise or a suppressed Horde or something like that, <laughs> right, I, a, a, a closet Horde. I never really saw even when even when Sylvanas became war chief I was like that's that's a thing I think it's I, th- I think it's cool it was kind of my reaction to it like that seems but yeah it was that moment when she mm-hmm. banshee screamed just wipes out you know uh, <laughs> a, a legion of soldiers and then comes back up, still in her banshee form, and continues her banshee scream and forms it into the words for the horde. It's just like that was it. Literally took my breath away because it was the first time I saw a war chief since Thrall, in my mm, opinion. Right? You know what I mean? Like Thrall was the war chief, and there was some there was some very war chief stuff about Garage. Absolutely, there was some very war. Uh, Vol'jin was a great leader. Absolutely. Um, and there were elements of the war chief, but I never, I have not had that for the horde, like blood or honor or blood and honor, you know, feeling for anyone <laughs> since thrall until that moment where I was like, ah, ha, 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 this, this is where this, this must've been what they were thinking when they made the decision. That's my Sylvanas story. It was surprising, I think, to me. It caught me off yeah. guard. I was like, wow, yay. Oh, now it's really good. Now it's it was good, and now it's really good. Anduin, on the other hand, I want to... I, I second what all you guys are saying. It's the moment where... I Because I'm still not knowing what's going to happen here. And that moment when he throws down the sword... First of all, I didn't know what happened when he like punched that guy into the ground 
Oh yeah, and the that was also awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, uh, was is that what? So because in my head I was going, oh, he's a paladin now, consecration. Like that's what they're gonna do with him. They're gonna give him his dad dad's powers too, and he's gonna be a paladin. So he's gonna be a light warrior. Okay, I get it. Um, and that's you know how, but realizing especially after what, reading that comic that we were just talking about where he takes he basically explodes this guy with the light like he has an incredible grasp of the light and i don't know like i don't have my you know saiyan power level monitor on or anything i'm not sure if his power level is over 9000 but i would assume that there are probably not many priests that can do that in in history that that have the power of Anduin. I'm thinking Velen and I don't know might yeah, be know. able to, that has the grasp of the understanding and control of the light that because of Anduin's kind of twisted history that he has been able to focus that power that his true nature is this nature of balance and light and truth and all that you know all that frou frou happy stuff right. um sorry uh and i do get excited about it because i yeah. and and Anduin, honestly i i talk crap about him because it's fun but he's a great character um and it's because he's uh he's he's he is true to his character however there's there's shadow in him and i think that's great i think there it's it's more about balance with him in some ways i don't know and i don't think we've seen all of it either and i don't know exactly if I'm making predictions or anything, but back to the cinematic, he has that moment of strength and he uses his emotions to be his strength. He uses his concern for his fallen soldiers to be his strength. And something we have forgotten to mention for some reason is the Alliance win that battle. Yeah. Right. We we the, the it doesn't say it in the cinematic, but but we I think, know. I think shoe boots. Yeah, we know. But I think shoe boots kind of hit it on the head with, yeah, we see Sylvanas. We see Sylvanas as a war chief, but Anduin is. Anduin comes out of that with more power. Sylvanas right. did some awesome stuff, and she rallies her troops and. Zappy yeah. Boy comes out and rocks face and Sour <laughs> Fang is Sour Fang is revitalized and does it's his awesome. war yeah. scream and you've got the charging Torin that but Anduin Anduin truly protects it, 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 there's power in the choices he makes. He can be the war chief, the war leader, the warrior. He could choose to do that and like Shubus pointed out, he throws his sword down and no I'm doing this my way. He's true to himself. He knows where his true power lies, and it lies in the light, and it lies in protection, and it lies in not necessarily healing, but he's a disc priest, right? <laughs> he's putting right. up <laughs> shields, right? You saw his his big, you know, um, his his giant biggest, his giant bubble, biggest power word barrier ever. But yeah, it was a huge. <laughs> but it's this. So yeah, and he comes out on top because of that. He wins, and I'm not saying Sylvanas doesn't have that, but as Shubus has alluded to in the in the past, and I don't, I can't disagree. Sylvanas seems to have her own agenda. Yeah, and where Anduin's agenda is the alliance, is being the good leader, is his mind is on his people. I can't say right. the same about Greymane, even though Shubus might disagree with me on that. <laughs> but because I think Greymane, I think he wants it to be, but I think Greymane's crazy. I think he wants revenge. I think he's going to I think we're going to see a deterioration. I think you're right that he starts out that way. But I think he has a Sylvanas type moment. And maybe we haven't heard of it yet, but my s prediction is that we're going to see Greymane become obsessed with ending Sylvanas and that's what he cares about more than he he I loses track of what matters, if that makes sense. But I don't know. I but it. Anduin, on the other hand, that you're right, that wouldn't be in his character. Which brings me to, we're going to move on, unless you guys have something real quick. Just uh, Anduin is so sexy in that. <laughs> Just so. <laughs> oh. He's, yeah, yeah. You, uh, I'm glad we didn't I... talk about Anduin when Taliesin was on, because he has, if you watch his videos, he has some real, he calls him the oh, angel yeah. prince, the angel prince, right. uh, 
he's he's more beautiful when he cries, things like that. That uh, right. I, I, <laughs> Taliesin, this is a hundred percent true. Has a crush on Anduin, and we know it. And Eva tells us an Anduin crush. And uh, yeah, Evatel should watch her back because uh, I think <laughs> if Anduin becomes a real person, she may have some competition, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we've got. Um, so my question moving on would be that battle. And this is something that Jared uh, uh, kind of help points out um, in our show notes. Uh, Jared does all our show notes and likes to add these little discussion questions uh that are very helpful by the way um does anduin go to the siege of undercity willingly is he reluctant to fight the horde or does he seek some sort of vengeance uh jared we'll let you start this one out so it's it's no mystery that that he he has been reluctant in the past um and i Personally, I believe that he is coerced by Greymane to hunt down uh, Sylvanas and that the entire reason that they siege the Undercity, aside from the the burning of Teldrassil, uh, which happens prior to uh, Undercity being sacked by the Alliance, uh, I think very strongly that Anduin is is coerced by his advisors uh namely Greymane um to to go after Sylvanas in her home city and put it under the guise of we're taking back Lordaeron you know all that kind of stuff I, I think there's a lot of pieces actually to going into it but I do think that that he he doesn't attack him, like he does like ultimately he gives the order obviously to to go attack the undercity but i don't think that that comes from his decision alone i think that he is advised to do this and that's not to say that he doesn't want to what i'm like the whole reason i put that question in is because i don't think that he made the decision on his own if that makes sense yeah uh shoe boots your thoughts um, I, I'm kind of torn. I think that the, the thing I want to know more about, and we will in a few months is, is what happens in Christy Golden's upcoming novel before the storm there, you know, the, the prologue to this book is, is out in the wild. You can read it. Uh, everyone at BlizzCon got a copy and it, the prologue ends with Sylvanas clearly setting her sights on Stormwind. She wants to attack Stormwind. And now, so if she does, like that's the prologue of this novel. So if she attacks Stormwind in this novel, then it seems to me that the taking of Undercity is a retaliation for that. But I don't know how Teldrassil fits into this. There's so it's easier to think about when you just think about Teldrassil and Undercity. But when Stormwind gets thrown into the mix, it's tough to say. I think that. Um, I mean, I, I think for sure Anduin is getting advice from people, and I and I'm I would say for sure Gen's advice is going to be to attack Undercity. I think that that would be that would be, you know, it's controversial to say, yeah. Um, but I also think that Anduin is is, and this is this is maybe just speaking to me, kind of buying into the idea that he's his own Manduin. But like the I I buy into the idea of him making that decision himself because just the same way in the very beginning of Legion, when Jaina advised him, we have to attack the horde and he made the difficult decision at the time. No, we need the horde right now, but he knows that we don't need the horde right now. You know, like the, the war with the Legion is over. And so I can see him pragmatically saying, you know what? I told, I told auntie Jaina two years ago, that now is not the time to attack the horde. But guess what? Now, now might be the time to attack the horde. So I think like we're going to probably continue to speculate about who sets off the first spark. Is it is it Gen Greymane? Does he burn down Teldrassil to deceive everybody? Is it is it Sylvanas? Who knows? I think we're going to get a lot of clarity really soon. But I it seems to me that the most logical reason that he's attacking. Um, under city with the information that we have now is in retaliation for an attack against Stormwind. That just makes sense to me. Yeah. It's, um, 
I, I can agree with you guys I, in, in, in a way. And I don't know. I'd like to – I just to play devil's advocate a little bit. And not I, – I don't th- – I honestly don't think that the character of Anduin makes any sense if he doesn't make choices based on what he thinks is best for all of Azeroth. And I don't just mean the Alliance. I think the Alliance is foremost right. in his mind. But I don't think – I don't think it's in his character to make a choice that's good for the alliance, but disregards the horde or mm-hmm. non-allied factions. Right? Um, right. I don't think that is in his character. Um, so that being said, I think that the clue to all this is in the cinematic that. Um, and both sides of it have kind of the same thing where and I don't remember if it was in the cinematic or actually in the uh, I think it was actually a conversation you have with Cadgar after the brief little side quest where he looks at the Azerite and says, this changes everything. Right. Like this is this changes everything. This there's not only is there a power in it, but it's springing up from the ground from that corrupted weapon right that's sticking into the heart of the planet and the titan soul that inhabits it i mean there's something it's almost like shah is what it feels like to me there's this shah energy there's something something about it that it might not necessarily control people the way the shah did but there's they know it's powerful and he he realizes when when seeing this whether it might actually physically control somebody or mentally control somebody or not this changes everything so that being said it, it makes a lot of sense that the war is over the azerite and that is why sylvanas attacks stormwind because stormwind has something that she needs and they won't give it to her. So she's going to attack them. She's going to take it because she needs it. Because for whatever reason she believes... I'm thinking that she believes that the Azerite has something to do with... Some some way to give her and the Forsaken uh, sustainability. Basically, you know, uh, eternal life, basically. Right? Because right. they can't reproduce, so they have to live eternally. Or find a way to... You know what I mean? They have to, they have to sustain. Because if, when they die, they die. Um, so some sort of link to that, that kind of power... Um, or whatever it is, but she wants it. That's why she attacks, right? Uh, it could be that uh, they have her sister. There's thoughts that maybe uh, uh, Valir, not Valira, uh, Val- Valeria, Varis, Varisa, Alyria, and Varisa. Thank you. I'm going to call them Valeria. That's their <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> celebrity couple name. Um, but Varisa, there's been talks that Varisa uh, hasn't long to live by some rumors or some speculations um maybe she does die somehow in some sort of conflict and stormwind has her body and sylvanas wants to resurrect her and maybe and bring her back to life as as a forsaken or something you know what i mean and it's true uh, and illyria won't allow it that could be i think that's a really cool reason why Sylvanas would attack Stormwind. I mean, you know, and the prequel, you know, you can read the uh, the preface of the book, and there, none of that's in there. Um, but who knows? I don't know. You can... <laughs> you, I mean, you touch on a really interesting point. Like we talked earlier about the the kind of cutscene that you can observe of Illyria and Torellian talking, and we talked about the the two deaths thing. But the thing that they're actually talking about is that she says it's time for me to see my sister. It's time for me to see Sylvanas, and Torellian tries to talk her out of it, and right. she says, "No, I got to go see her now." We don't know, you know, are is this going to are we going to get a new set of quests tomorrow? Like is this going to develop right. every week? We, is, we'll is find this, we'll find it, out. Is this how the battle for Azeroth begins because these two sisters can't, you know, something happens. Like I said, I think the burning of Teldrassil has something to do with those two sisters. I think that's where they meet. I think something happens there. I'm not saying it's Greymane. Um, but something happens, it gets out of hand and and the whole thing yeah. goes nuts and uh so I don't, I, I don't know. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, who knows what's going to happen when Sylvanas and Illyria see each other? I feel like, based on 
war crimes, the novel war crimes, I feel like Verisa might be at kill on site status for Syl- Syl- Sylvanas. So um, it'd be interesting to see them get back together. But anyways, the point is Illyria is presumably going to see Sylvanas and we are presumably going to see this in game in the near right. future. Um, and this could be terrible, like something really terrible could happen that could lead to her wanting to attack Stormwind, right? Like that could be where it comes from. We're just going to have to wait and see. Yeah, you could have some sort of SI7 assassins or rogue assassins that are trying to take out Sylvanas and end up getting Illyria. I mean, no, you can't do that because Illyria has to be the Void Elf person, but I don't know. Right. All sorts of things. Who knows? Either way war is upon us and i don't all of those things as far as going back to the cinematic and anduin attacking um undercity i believe that blizzard is smart enough at this point and 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 good enough at what they're they do as far as their storytelling is concerned they're going to be able to get the story out there and it's not going to it's going to be in character. Anduin's not going to attack Undercity because he wants to destroy the horde. Right. Th- there's that doesn't make sense. Um Grey Main yeah. Grey Main could suggest or push for him to attack Undercity because he wants to get to Selvanus. You know what I mean? And we've mentioned this before. The 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 lines in the dialogue is uh, you know, we have to get her or whatever. I don't remember exactly. We have her cornered. We have her cornered. Right, exactly. Um, and that's coming from Grey Mane, which I, I think a hundred percent Grey Mane is down for anything that's going to either kill or capture Sylvanas so that he can bring his justice to his son's death, right? Um but King Anduin, it's gotta be more than that. It's got to be more than that. He's either got to, like Shuboots was suggesting last week, see Sylvanas as a threat, or a couple weeks ago. He's either got to see Sylvanas as a threat, as a threat to all of Azeroth, including the Horde, or there's something else about Lordaeron that's important that the Alliance be in control of it. And right. not just to kick the Forsaken out. Because I think, honestly, the character of Anduin cares about the Forsaken. He cares about Sylvanas. He cares about the Horde. He wants, he does want that peace. But sometimes, you know, sometimes you bring a hug and sometimes you bring a hammer. <laughs> I, that Sharku 20, or 2018. That was a yeah. quote. I just made that up. I'm sure someone said it before. But it's that's, sometimes you bring a hug. Sometimes, sometimes you bring, you bring a, a hug and sometimes you bring a hammer. And it's, but that's, I think Anduin knows that, and I think he is smart enough to, uh, if or if you're a paladin, you bring both. <laughs> Thank you, Dark.com, uh, in the <laughs> chat room. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's he's got to what for whatever reason he goes to the Undercity. I think he absolutely does it willingly, but I don't think he does it. I don't want to say, reluctantly isn't the word. Yeah. If he has, it was just to, the best word that I had. At the, if, at if, the he time. Ha, if he has to bring war, if he has to bring a battle, if he has to bring the city to siege, he doesn't do it. He's not doing a preemptive strike. He doesn't rush right? into it. Well, first of all, we know Teldrassil happens first, mm. right? Right. Um, and we're assuming that Stormwind happens even before that. If depending on we, whatever happens in the novel, maybe that right. maybe that preface is after the siege of Orgrimmar or the siege of Undercity. You know, right. I'm not sure. But either way, he doesn't rush into it. He doesn't do it without consulting the light, without consulting the other faction leaders of the Alliance, mm-hmm. without, you know, as my mom would say, uh, you know, without praying on it. You know, he <laughs> right. doesn't just rush into it. Uh, he it's it's something I, I don't know if I'm convinced that it's reactionary to something else that happened. But it's planned, and it's something he believes in his with his whole heart that has to be done for the betterment of Azeroth, which is why I have no problem remaining an Alliance uh, member because that's where my a my raid team is, and I love you guys, and I'm never leaving. But also, <laughs> I do like the character of Anduin Wren, uh, you know, even though I like to pick on him sometimes. But that all the time, th- yeah, it's true because he is kind of a whiny baby, but. <laughs> But he's always in character. He's the cool thing about him is he's 
you know, what I want to be IRL, like even the bad guys, he cares. He cares about the bad guys. He wants to do everything he can for the bad guys to be good. Mm -hmm. What can I do to make the bad guys not bad? No one's really a bad guy. He's kind of a big hippie. You know, yeah. he's very much like, man, everybody's cool, man. It's all good. It's all good. But as a leader, he knows that sometimes you got to bring the hammer. Mm-hmm. Not a right. hug. <laughs> Not a hug. <laughs> Coltrane <laughs> says that's our new uh, catchphrase, by the way. Uh, he's in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, bring a hammer, not a hug is our new catchphrase. Maybe we should try that out at the end of the show. I don't think so. But unfortunately, <laughs> we have reached the end of the show. We've got a lot more that we could have talked about. Here are just some, here are some discussion questions for homework class. Um, how is he going to react to – we'll, we'll ask this really quick uh, in two sentences or less, guys. How does he react – no, let's do this a one-word one word answer All right, to this question. Okay. And you guys know what's coming I think up, I so, can do so it. think about it. So we'll start with shoe boots. How does Anduin react to seeing Aunt Jaina when they reach Kol Taras? One word, or or a short phrase. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Jared, how does Anduin react to his seeing his Aunt Jaina when they reach Kol Taras? Surprised. Surprised. Very fun. And class for homework, uh, I'm going to need two pages on uh, that prompt. How does he react to seeing Aunt Chena when they reach Cold to Us? <laughs> we would love to hear your comments. Um, uh, and if you uh, – we'll get to that when we get to the out- outro. I was jumping ahead a little bit. Um, but thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we didn't have much mail. We did get uh, an email from uh, Paula Schreiker. Um uh, who uh, told me that I pull away from my mic too much? I'm sorry, Paula. I I, really, I know I, sh- I shouldn't do that. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. I have a bad and and you're you're in good company because Pat Crane yells at me about that all the time when I'm on CTR. So uh, I will attempt to do better um, and uh, can always continue to have the best uh, quality podcast that we can put out. I uh, also want to thank Oyeo, Oyeo, Oyo, Oyo. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> Our buddy Oyo, who uh, 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 sent us some fan art that we're going to get out to you guys in a little bit. He uh, uh, he took our logo and did some fun stuff with it, and we really appreciate that. So we're gonna, you guys are going to see that uh, soon enough. But big shout out to him. Uh, thanks for joining us. Before we go, we're going to go around the room and talk a little bit about how you can get in touch with our host, Jared. So my uh, Twitter handle has been misleading. I got it changed uh, to prosperity underscore 42. Uh, You can also find me on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash prosperity 42. Very good. And shoe boots, where can we get to you? How can we get Uh, to you? At what point in the universe does you get to? Just you get to, you can get to me at any point in the universe. Um, I am at the shoe boots on Twitter. Uh, my email is the shoe boots at gmail.com. Um, I, I stream on Twitch. Um, but I'll get, I, I'll, I'll have more to say about my Twitch streaming soon. Um, as well as uh, YouTube stuff, but everything is the shoe boots. Um, and that's where you can find me. I love the Scott Johnson announcements we got going today. It's like, Hey, I'm doing something later. Maybe so stick around. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm shark you can find me on Twitter. Shark underscore CTR twitch.tv slash shark underscore CTR. You can find me on the convert to raid, uh, battle net news. Um, uh, most of the time we record on Tuesday nights at 11 Eastern at, uh, uh, twitch.tv slash convert to raid. You can also find that podcast on, uh, Stitcher and, um, uh, all of your podcast was Stitcher, Google play, Apple podcasts. I even think that one's on Spotify maybe. Um, but yeah, lots Perhaps. of cool places. By the way, we haven't talked about this yet, guys. I'm going to just kind of throw this in here. If you go to convert to raid.com. We are a member of the Convert to Raid podcasting club, I guess, team. Um, uh, Pat Crane has very, very graciously um, 
uh, been shown interest in our podcast, in our little podcast. And uh, we, you can, if you go to convertoraid.com and look at the podcasts, uh, the list of podcasts they have on that site, you can find us. And you can also, I don't know if you guys even know this, but there's also a list of our podcasts available there. So you can also listen to us from the convertoraid.com website uh, and find other really, really awesome podcast podcasts. What is wrong with my voice? Um, I'm not editing professional any podcaster. of this out. I'm not editing any of this out, folks. This is going to be in the live broadcast. Um, broadcast? <laughs> pr- pr- proudcast. Uh, oh, God. I'm not so proudcast. You can find a <laughs> lot of cool podcasts on that show. All of the CTR hosts uh, that have their podcasts up there. Uh, even some of the folks that uh, don't get to host the show as much, but work really big back scene, or behind the scenes like Jewel Scott and Jocelyn Moffat. Um, all of their, so if you enjoy podcasts about Blizzard stuff in particular, check those podcasts out. You can check us out there too. And check out ConvertToRaid.com just because... I'm on that show and I said so. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that was not scripted. Back to the script. Uh, also, we would love, uh, we are set up as the show. Um, sorry, hold on. Check that. I'm still not editing this out, guys. <laughs> We want you to get in touch with the show, and you can email us at setbackpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at setbackpodcast. And we are also set up on Twitch. Uh, those of you that are watching the live stream right now, uh, hello. You guys already know this. Uh, you can watch us live on Monday nights at 9 o'clock uh, Eastern, by the way, um, on our Twitch ch- uh, channel. And you can also find us at YouTube on our setback podcast uh, youtube.com slash setback podcast so check those things out we also want to hear any feedback you have uh i just said that we'd love to hear any feedback you'd have i'm gonna have to edit this script i'm gonna edit the script not the podcast you guys uh, please listen to the podcast all the way through because especially when my brain starts farting everywhere and i screw it up it gets really really fun <laughs> it's good fun we, we've already i'm pretty sure we've gone two hours already so this is just at this point it's what we call in the biz a train wreck <laughs> we'd love to hear any we really would love to hear any feedback that you guys have so send us some information tweet at us get us an email we want to read it on the show uh any questions or requests or comments uh we are absolutely ecstatic when we get uh information from you guys so keep sending it our way this is uh, um uh, 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 uh um but yeah there we go uh i don't do we check our patronage this week um patreon i'll talk a little bit about we patreon not, we don't have any we don't have any, any new any brand well. new ones um but if you enjoy the show and you enjoy our um sexy banter between one another and want that to happen 24 7 our first patron goal is uh, opening a live discord server up uh, uh that the show sponsors that will uh, have uh, you know a chat room in there that we can just have a bunch of nerdy lore debates all over the place and we can talk about who's cooler Sylvanas or uh, Illidan or, or Sylvanas or Anduin and Illidan Anduin. and how Arthas is going to resurface in the lore sometime somehow uh, so please consider donating to that we really appreciate all of our patrons and we hope you consider being a patron at some point in time um, the more you can help us out the more we're going to be able to make uh, better content and get that content out to you sooner so uh, invest in your podcasting future my friends no five star reviews this week. Uh, really, it helps so much if you haven't given us a five star review and you enjoy this show. Please consider going to Apple Podcasts or iTunes and giving us a five star review. Um, it really helps us out. And tell your friends about us. Keep us going. We are a growing podcast. It's been incredible to watch uh, to watch our numbers grow a little bit and the fact and getting the feedback from you guys. I am personally so happy you're enjoying the show. I know I speak for Shoe Boots and Jared and myself. We are honored that you uh, take two hours out of your week to waste listening to us nerd out about stuff that probably doesn't matter in the long run. Uh, But we have fun doing it, and we hope you have fun listening to it. Keep coming back. I love you guys. Let's end it there. Catchphrase. Catchphrase. Catchphrase.